Hope you had a fun 4th of July. Uh, my family and I definitely did. We, um, we normally don't do anything for 4th of July. We like to use our freedom to just do nothing, which is kind of a nice luxury. You know, not many people get to do that. But uh, yeah, yesterday we had our we had these awesome neighbors and they invited us over. We had hot dogs and hamburgers and did little fireworks, the whole deal. It was an awesome, awesome time. But hey, glad you're here. Uh, glad you're here too online if you're watching at home or just somewhere around the world. I'm so happy to have all of you here. If you were here last week, then you got to hear a really, really great sermon on Jehovah Rohi. It's the name of God that means the Lord our shepherd. And, and I absolutely loved it. And, and one thing just stuck out to me the most. My favorite part was when Pastor Anthony essentially called all of us sheep. You know, if God is to be our shepherd, then we have to be sheep. And he preached on Psalm 23, which is this incredibly rich Bible passage. But, but man, I just couldn't get that image out of my head of, of being a sheep. And I started thinking, it's like, you know, he never really said what kind of sheep we have to be. And so most people are probably thinking, you know, a sheep looks something like this guy right here. Like real cute looking. He's cuddly. You know, we get the, aw, yeah, he's nice. But today, when we look into God's word, I'm going to show you how we can be transformed into sheep like this. It's a battle sheep. Look at this guy. He's got the helmet. He's got the eye black. He's got the, if you look close, he's got a little knife on his hoof. He's, yeah, this guy is ready for anything. I mean, ain't you ever wondered where they get steel wool? This guy. Y'all, I love this battle sheep. We can be, that ought to be us. This guy's ready for anything, for everything, ready to follow his shepherd into any valiant mission, whatever the risk may be. He's ready. He's prepared. And I think, I get excited thinking about how that could be us. You know, the first, one of the first missionaries to reach Muslims in India, is, uh, it was a young guy named Henry Martin. And in his late 20s, he sailed out to India to go um, minister to them and try and reach them. And uh, most of his life, he suffered from really severe illnesses that threatened his life. And during his, his years in ministry in India, many of the people he served with died from just poor health and just bad living conditions. And so at the beginning of the year in 1812, uh, he wrote in his journal, and I, want, I have this excerpt I want to share with you, and you'll see the words behind me. So January 1812, spared by mercy to see the beginning of another year. The last has been in some respects a memorable year. Transported in safety to Shiraz, I have been led by the particular providence of God to undertake a work, the idea of which never entered my mind till my arrival here, but which has gone on without material interruption and is now nearly finished. To all appearance, the present year will be more perilous than any I have seen. But if I live to complete the Persian New Testament, my life after that will be of less importance. But whether life or death be mine, may Christ be magnified in me. If he has work for me to do, I cannot die. In his lifetime, Henry Martin was the first person to translate the New Testament of the Bible into Urdu, Arabic, and he completed that Persian New Testament as well. Ten months after writing this, in October of that year, he died. But I love that last line so much. I cannot die. I just, I just wish I could have been there to see him write it. I just imagine him so confident in God that he knew that if God wanted to use him to do a work, nothing was going to get in the way. Not even death could stop God's plans for him. I just wonder what might look different in our lives if we had that same confidence in God. Would you march into battle and have a seven-day concert around the walls of your enemy only to yell on the seventh day and expect those walls to crumble down? Would you be willing to stand face-to-face -face with a giant and declare his demise with just a few rocks in your pocket? Would you be willing to risk your life to enter into the court of a king and demand his attention. See, these are the stories of Joshua and David and Esther, and they knew something about God that led them straight into the heart of his will in the most inspiring ways. Yo, that can be us too. Consider the story of Abraham, a man with a, a reputation for making uh, the wrong choice at the wrong time. Anybody here already feel like they can relate more to Abraham than maybe the first three? Time after time, when you read Abraham's story, you see that whenever he comes face to face with something that challenged his faith or his trust in God, he often chose poorly. He, he, he found some way to lie or cheat or some lesser solution to try to get around the problem rather than relying 
on God to provide something for him. You see, Abraham's sin was uh, placing more confidence in his own abilities than God's ability. But each time where Abraham failed, God would intervene and provide for him. And so there's this pattern of Abraham failing and God prevailing that continues over and over until we get to this one striking moment that is unforgettable. God would demand Abraham's son, Isaac. And so this picture right here is um, my earliest memory in church or from church is tied to this picture or one similar to it. I was a young boy and I attended a Catholic church and I remember hearing this story for the first time. And all I can remember is this visual, right, of a father about to kill his son. And I couldn't really make sense of it as a child and as an adult, it's still a really uncomfortable thought. Yet what we see here is Abraham's face with a difficult decision. Would he look for a way out? Would he try something on his own as he had tried and failed so many times before? Or in this moment, would he lean into God and trust that somehow God would would, would make this work out and we provide something. You see, the author of Hebrews actually writes that Abraham honestly trusted and believed that God was capable of raising Isaac from the dead. And so in the moment before Abraham sacrificed his son Isaac, an angel appears to Abraham. Just then, the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, said the angel. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Then Abraham looked up and saw behind him a ram caught in the thicket, caught by its horn. So he went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. So to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. This is the name of God that we're going to look at today. Jehovah Jireh. Within this name is a truth that transforms. A truth that transforms everything in your life. It transformed everything in Abraham's life. It transformed everything in my life. And I am confident that it will transform everything in your life as well. But before we continue, we need to understand that God is an infinite being. And he's chosen to reveal just a few things about himself. So for this reason, we need to ask the question, why would God specifically choose to show us that he is the God who provides? I believe it's because you and I, like Abraham, we're more prone to place trust in ourselves than we are to trust in God. I mean, how many times have you turned to God as a last resort? How many times have you exhausted every other option before God only to find yourself on your knees begging in despair? God, please, I hope there's something you might be able to do. Or maybe it's more subtle than that. Maybe it's a little lie here and there on your tax return because you could really use that extra cash to pay down some debt. Maybe it's rationalizing away God's calling, saying now just isn't a good time for change. Church, would you be willing to take a moment for us to, I want to pray to invite the Holy Spirit to, before we continue, to draw our attention to whatever areas of our life where we've doubted God's ability to provide. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Holy Spirit, together we come to you. Hearts in our hands, we ask you to reveal to us the blind spots in our faith. Show us now what areas of our life we have not fully trusted in the God who provides. Draw them from darkness to light and compel us to feel a holy anger toward these things. Increase in us a passion to cast aside the lies we tell ourselves and to replace them with the truth of Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Let us not continue a moment longer blind to our own deceptions. Lead us to grow more in likeness of Jesus when he prayed, yet not as I will, but as you will, Father. Amen. To have the kind of confidence that David, Joshua, Esther, Abraham, and countless others have shown is to be transformed by the truth of God's providential nature. We begin by recognizing that God's providence is better than anything else we could ever do on our own. Our first point this morning is that God will provide for you. 
God will provide for you. To be transformed by this truth, we must learn to rely on truth above all else. This means we lean into facts over feelings. You may feel like God is nowhere to be found in your darkest moments, but the fact is the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit, Psalm 38, 4, 18. We need facts over feelings to walk in confidence of God's ability to provide for our needs. Fact number one, God is all-knowing. So fun thing here, do we have anyone here this morning who's willing to admit that they struggle with worrying? Just a quick show of hands, let us know you're out there. Like, oh, you got some worries. Yeah, I got you. That's definitely me. Uh, where sometimes you, just, you get caught in a worry. You don't even know how it happens. And all of a sudden you're just, you're feeling that stress, right? You're worried about this thing that might happen. And I always think back to my mom, who when I was a teenager, I did a horrible impression of her earlier, so I'm just going to say it in my voice. Uh, my mom would say to me when I was a teenager, she's like, Scotty, don't you realize I'm your mom? It's my job to worry about you. And I always thought, like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. And now that I have kids, it kind of makes a little more sense. As much as I love my mom and I love her for caring for me, friends, I have a really exciting fact to share for it with you. For the believer, you don't have to worry. Because God is all-knowing, you can have rest. You can confidently fall asleep in his arms, trusting that he knows your every need. Let's look at Matthew 6. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So Jesus is telling us here that unlike the rest of the world, we can have confidence in God to provide for us because he knows what we need. And just like my favorite infomercials in the 90s, but wait, that's not all. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. Sparrows, y'all, like when is the last time you took note of a little bird's welfare? Yet the God of all creation is so deeply invested in his world that not even a sparrow escapes his knowledge. He knows. Or consider King David. When, uh, how deeply he knew the heart of God when he wrote the following. O oh Lord, you have searched me. And known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways, even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Do you see it again? God knows everything about David. He knows everything about you. Even the hairs on your head are numbered. God knows them. He knows every detail about you. And it gets even better than that. In verse 5, David writes that God has surrounded him and, and lays his hand upon him. Man, that just, that just gives me chills. You know when you read, you read a verse in the Bible and the Holy Spirit makes it clear, you're like, oh, I get that. Imagine embracing your child and you, or your grandchild, and you pull them in for a, a big, strong hug, and you whisper in their ear, I have known you all the days of your life. I know what you need, and I love you. And then you, you pull them in even tighter somehow, and you, you say, and I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will care for you. Man, isn't that just beautiful? Is there anyone in your life who knows you like that? Have you ever felt that kind of love? Because you can. It's right here in God's arms. He will never forget you. He will never abandon you. You've already seen how he knows everything you need. I mean, man, I don't even know everything I need. I know a lot of what I want. I'm not too great at what I need. Just ask my wife every time she makes cupcakes. I always feel like I, I need like five of them. But ain't that the truth though? We get pretty good at knowing what we want. But if we look back at our past, how well have we done at knowing what we truly need? Anyone here get it perfect? Anyone here this morning willing to stand up before all of us and declare, I have a spotless record of decision making? 
Friends, that's too much pressure. That's like trying to find your way with a broken compass or, or rolling the dice and, and crossing your fingers and I hope it works out. No wonder so many Christians live like unbelievers, lost in fear and worry about how they're going to pay the bills or, or how we're going to get through this next challenge. And yes, I admit that there needs to be concern for the things that we are responsible for. But for the most part, our worries are consumed by things we have no control over. Why rob yourself of God's peace by listening to this liar whispering lies? The unbeliever is held captive by their worry. But the believer is freed by the God that provides Jehovah Jireh. I want to give you all something to say. When when, when the enemy tries to tempt you to doubt God, maybe you're feeling it yourself. You're bringing your life. I'm not sure how it's going to work. Here's what I want you to fight back with. Prove to me that God is not powerful enough to help. What situation is God not powerful enough to help and work in that, in that part of your life? How is God not able? The answer is never. There is nothing beyond God's ability to provide for you. Fact number two, God is all powerful. Remember how I said Abraham had a poor record of not trusting God? Well, that extended to his wife, Sarah, as well. In a miraculous demonstration of God's power, he helps Abraham and Sarah to conceive a child when she was 90 and he's 100 years old. But right before that happens, we read the following. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. And then Isaac is born. And then we fast forward to the New Testament, and we look at pretty much anything Jesus did. He literally walked on water, cured the blind, healed the deaf, healed the lame, and brought people back from the dead to life. Obviously, God has the ability to work supernaturally in our lives. In a similar story, the birth of Jesus' cousin John, we read in the Bible that nothing is impossible with God. And I want to briefly share a picture with you. So now I admit this probably isn't much to look at. And if you can't tell, um, those are actually my shoes. Those are my shoes in the middle of the road. But for me, this is easily one of the most treasured pictures of I've ever taken in my entire life. I was back home in uh, Austin, Texas for a weekend earlier this summer, and um, I had some free time, and so I ran about five miles from my house to this exact spot right here. I wanted to, I wanted to be there. I wanted to, I wanted to go back to that, 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 that place. I hadn't been, been there maybe 10 or 12 years. I just wanted to be in that moment again. And I took a picture because I wanted to remember it and may, maybe, maybe even show it someday. So why was it so important? Because it was right here, at this corner of the road, that God showed me that he is all-powerful. I was about 17 years old, and I was not a follower of Jesus. I wasn't a Christian yet. God was working on that. I had plans of running my first marathon in October of 2007, um, and training was not going well for me, despite the fact that I was super prideful and I was so full of self-confidence, and um, I kind of made myself my own God as a teenager. Like, oh, I can, I'm, I'm the best I can do. I just got to try harder and be good or be better. Whatever that little that, that rat race is that people try to do. And despite all of that, I finally encountered something that was too hard for me. I'd, I'd all but quit on my training. You know, I'd, I was either staying out too late, and I was tired in the morning, and I, I wouldn't go run, or I just wasn't even motivated. And the next thing I knew, it was July and the, the race was three months away, and I, I would have to run 26.2 miles. And by this point, I'd never even run more than 6.2 miles. And I had this, this horrible week, this one of those weeks where you feel like everything is just falling apart. Work was bad. Things with my family wasn't great. Uh, things with my friends, were, it was just this horrible combination of events, and it's the middle of Texas summer, and if you ever spent any time in a Texas summer, it's that humid, uh, horrible heat that, like, is just absolutely nasty, and it was like a heat wave, so it's 105-something degrees, and I got the idea of, I just want to go run. I just want to go run, because as a kid, I would always run to kind of, you know, decompress a little bit, and I wanted to run and run. I don't know where. I didn't care where I was going to go. I just wanted to run and run until I passed out on the street somewhere, because I was a dramatic teenager, and, uh, 
what happened is I got myself lost. And I was feeling really weary. And I came up to this road, this spot right here. And for the first time, I prayed. The prideful, stubborn boy who always trusted in his own abilities to succeed broke down. My legs hurt. I was dehydrated. And I legitimately didn't know where I was. And so I said probably the the worst prayer of all time. It went something kind of like this. God, people tell me that you're powerful. So would you show that to me? Help me get home. And if this whole thing I'm running is more than 10 miles, I'll trust that through your power, together we can, we can do that marathon in three months. You know, in that moment, so much about me changed. Years of never accepting anyone's help faded away. And I continued to just lean on God's strength, trusting in that. And step by step, I began to see things I recognized and my legs were still working and I found my way back home. Now, some people will think the miracle here was God's power in helping me complete the marathon three months later. Some will say that the, the miracle was the, uh, the, 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 mag- the miraculous healing I had on my knee. I, heard a, I, I pulled a ligament in my knee two weeks before the race. And some will say that the miracle was the day after I ran that route when I got in my car and I drove around the exact route I ran to see how far I went, pulling into my driveway to see the odometer hit 10.1 miles, my promise to God echoing in my mind. But friends, the miracle for me was that the, the, the big demonstration of God's almighty power was when he was strong enough to show me how weak I am. When God's power transformed my perception of myself from stubborn and full of self-pride to a 17-year-old boy crying on the side of the road because he needed help to get home. Have you ever experienced something like that? Uh, Maybe it was an addiction that God just took away overnight. Or maybe it was some seemingly unbreakable habit that God wiped away from your life. Or maybe you've been a part of one of those supernatural healings that just baffles medical experts and doctors alike. The same God who calmed the stormy seas with a word can transform the storm in your heart. Let me say it another way. What you think you can't do doesn't matter as much as what you know God can do. And this fact will transform everything. Fact three, God is all loving. More than any other fact, the truth that God is all loving feels under attack. We look to the Bible to read verses like 1 John 4, 16 that literally say God is love. Yet how quickly we are to doubt this. It began as early as the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell for the lie that God was holding out on them. That his one singular command to not eat from a very specific tree was somehow God's way of keeping his very best from them. Isn't it wild how we can still think like that? I mean, anyone with kids surely has experienced some of these, uh, these negotiations or perceptive mistakes. Let me show you a few examples right behind me. So this is a real thing. I got these off Twitter. If you go search hashtag Reason my kid is crying, you can, you can find all these. So this one says, Dad won't let me lick anything, like the window, or the electrical outlet cover, or the stairs. Come on, Dad, let him have some fun. Let's look at another one. We wouldn't let him ride in the trunk. I mean, that would be a really enlightening experience for your kid, don't you think? Be a loving parent, come on. Let's take a look at another one. Because daddy wouldn't let me eat chalk. What a bummer. I mean, don't you know anything about how like nutrition and taking care of kids? They gotta have some chalk, right? Let's look at another one here. I wouldn't let him eat the rest of the football. It looks good to me. I mean, that's what Adam and Eve said, right? They felt, oh, the fruit looks good, it looks tasty. I'm gonna take a bite. Let's look at another one. I told her she can't marry daddy or her brother. Bummer. Let's look at one more. He wasn't allowed to electrocute himself. Screaming and crying, you don't love me, mommy. Don't let me have any fun. Don't let me do anything. Man, I mean, come on, parents. Let a kid ride in the trunk for once. You know what I'm saying? 
Show them some love here. Surely adults would never conduct themselves. I mean, God's people would definitely never do anything like that, right? They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Let me just recap and catch you up. God had just unleashed 10 miraculous events to free all of the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. And now... They're stuck between the Red Sea, massive, unpassable, and this army. The Egyptian army has been sent to go kill them all. And they they face their first test of God's goodness. And they say, I'd rather be enslaved to them in Egypt than have to rely on the goodness of God. That's, That's madness. That's a total lack of belief that God is all loving. So how does God, the loving father, respond? He splits the Red Sea in half and makes escape possible on dry land. But this wasn't the last time God would need to intervene. Just two chapters later, we see more complaining. Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. How does the all-loving God respond? He creates a food called manna to fall from the sky. And the next morning, all these quail cover the camp so they can, they can go hunt them. And for the next 40 years, God made sure that they always had enough food to eat. But again, this would not be the last time that they failed to trust in the goodness of God. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So God made water pour out from a rock. Church, there's an obvious pattern here. One that is incredibly uncomfortable and one that is altogether wonderful. You cannot exhaust the limits of God's love ever. Recognize the fact that God is is all loving and there is nothing that can separate you from his love. For I am sure That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. When I combine these three facts, I arrive with a powerful truth. God knows my every need. God has the power to do something about it. And God loves me so dearly that he wants to provide and care for me in the best way. This is Jehovah Jireh. And it should transform everything in your life. But the first step is asking, how do we take hold of these truths and move them from our head to our hands? Jesus directs us to a simple command. Returning to Matthew 6, Jesus has just outlined all of the things that unbelievers worry about and then gives the alternate response for the believer in verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Our final point this morning draws our attention to how God's provision empowers us to leave behind the worries of this world and to learn and what it means to focus on serving the kingdom of God. So our last point is going to be God's provision is our confidence. See, Jesus' command reads simple enough, but we need to unpack what he means by kingdom of God. So serving the kingdom of God, I want to show you this really great insight from a pastor named John MacArthur. To seek first God's kingdom is to pour out our lives in the eternal work of our heavenly father. To seek God's kingdom is to seek to win people into that kingdom, that they might be saved and that God might be glorified. What would that look like in your life? What needs to be realigned in order to effectively pour out your life to this end? There's this great story of an older woman at a church I knew back in Texas. Uh, She was probably in her 70s, and she was the leader of this uh, prayer ministry. 
And she devoted much of her time to the leading prayer groups and, and trying to start little prayer circles and always get, like super nosy, always trying to get everyone's life to know how she could be praying for them. She just wanted to know how she could best be praying for people. And one Sunday morning, she woke up several hours earlier than normal. She told me she felt like the Holy Spirit himself had awoken her. So immediately she began to, began to pray and ask God what purpose there might be in waking up so early. During her time in prayer, she felt nothing more than the, the need to be awake. So she did the next normal thing and she decided she would just go to church a couple hours early. She wanted to see if maybe there was something there that God wanted her to be involved in. Little did she know that at that time, a young teenager had just spent the night sleeping outside and had wandered into the prayer room. So she enters the prayer room and she saw this young boy uh, with a muddy t-shirt pass out on the front row. And this is the part I always kind of wondered about the story because no disrespect to all her awesome, sweet, seven-year-old ladies, but typically if you see some dude looking like he just came out of the, you know, the ground, you don't, you don't walk in and talk to him. You, you leave. You, you get some help. You should be concerned. I mean, he could be a crazy person or, or whatever is worse than a crazy person. But instead, she firmly believed that this young man, dirty, passed out in the prayer room, was the reason God had woken her up so early. So after gently waking the young man and reassuring him he wasn't in any trouble, she spoke with him about God. She shared with him that God had led her to him. And she wanted to tell him all about God's love for him. She shared from Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. She told him that, that God wants to work in his life and that he should put all his hope in God. And the young man cried with her and felt a special kind of love he'd never known until that moment. She prayed for him, and then he left. Didn't even go to church. He got out of there. His world completely shaken. You know, all she knew that morning was that God had a plan for her. And she disregarded all of her personal plans. Whatever she had planned that morning, she pushed it aside to make sure that she could be available to invest in what God wanted to use her for. What she didn't know is that that young man had just come from a graduation party. He had uh, slept outside. He was questioning everything in his future. He felt lost, hopeless, entirely uncertain of his life. She also didn't know that six months later, he would pray again to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. She also didn't know that within a year, God would call this young man into a life of ministry. She didn't know that he would marry a beautiful girl from New Mexico who would teach him how to read his Bible, and together they would move to Colorado to one day end up right here standing before you preaching about God's miraculous provision in my life. But God knew, and God planned it. He made all of it possible because of his great love for me. And guys, he absolutely loves you too. You know, you might be here this morning and maybe you're online watching from somewhere around the world and none of this is really connecting for you. You're like, Scott, that's great. I love hearing that God's done some cool stuff in you and all those old people in the Bible, but in my life, I've only known pain and heartache. What has God ever done for me? How can I be sure that God loves me. Let me tell you this. When Abraham nearly sacrificed his son because God told him to, would anyone doubt his radical commitment to God? If Abraham was willing to surrender his child, would there be anything else in all of his possession more valuable, more challenging to give up? When God so loved the world, that he gave up his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not die, but have eternal everlasting life. Is there any reason to doubt God's devotion to you? His love for you. When you say to Jesus, how much do you really love me? He goes to the cross and he says, I love you this much. Oh friend, that feeling inside you right now, that yearning for something more. You're not the only one who feels that way. Every Christian in here 
has felt that. The moment they invited Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, and I pray that every day thereafter continues to feel it. Some lives don't change in a moment, but the right moment can change your life. Jehovah Jireh is the God who provides, and he wants to provide you with the gift of his love, the gift of his love that comes from Jesus. He wants to give you Jesus, and we can receive that provision right now. Whether you've been a follower of Jesus your whole life, or you're thinking about making that choice right now, we need God's hand on every day of our life. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for loving us, for being all-knowing, for being all-powerful, for being all-loving and all-good. You are perfect and holy and pure. There is no one like you. Lord, I admit that I've sometimes trusted in other things instead of trusting in you. God, please continue to show us that grace. Continue to provide for us. Teach us to preach the gospel to us every day. We need to be made new. Lord, teach us to to lean into that yearning, that feeling for something more in our life, to have more of you. Like Moses who said, show me your glory. He wanted to go to the source of every good and perfect gift. He wanted to see you. Lord, let that be the cry of our hearts. God, show us your glory. Show us your glory in every uh, sphere of influence you've put us in. God, we are always providentially placed exactly where you want us, when you want us. Lord, not even a sparrow falls from the sky apart from you knowing it. You know where we are right now. You know where we were last night. You know what's coming tomorrow. You know what that next phone call is going to bring. Nothing surprises you. And we can be confident in that. We can trust an unknown future to a known God who is so loving, who sent his only son for us. He is radically committed to us and to you. Lord Jesus, let this be impressed upon our heart forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much.